everyone, and welcome back to the channel where your likes, comments, and subs are always greatly appreciated. If you've been watching my channel over the past year or two, you probably are aware that I prefer to record my music using a multi-track recorder. I've used a computer before with a DAW and different types of interfaces, and it works and you can get pristine quality audio with it. But over, I don't know, the past 15, 20 years, for whatever reason, I just prefer a standalone box with its own system, its own set of inputs, its own fader controls in order to record. Uh, this goes back years ago when I was using a Fostex four track cassette recorder, um, then upgrading eventually for nostalgic purposes, my favorite multi-track recorder, the Roland VS 800 series. That's where I recorded my very first album from start to finish on one of those multi-track recorders. Uh, and then moving on over the years to different types of uh, Tascam units from Korg units. Um, for the past 12 years or so, I've been using a Zoom R8 recorder. This thing's been a workhorse for me. It has eight tracks, two inputs, onboard effects. It has a sequencer that you can use to build in your own rhythm sections and drum patterns. This thing has worked very well for me. For the past, I'd say, year or so, nearly a year, I have been using the Zoom R20, which is a 16-track multi-track recorder. It has eight inputs. So you could do eight tracks simultaneous recording. It also has onboard effects. But the big thing that separates this from the rest of the competition is it has this large color touchscreen, which allows you to clearly see your audio regions and you can edit them using the touchscreen. So you could split them up, you can copy paste in ways that's far more intuitive and easier to use than it is with a lot of the old school multi-trackers that rely on small screens and you have to set up markers to copy and paste A to region B and so on. So this is far more intuitive. It's a little bit closer to what you could expect with a DAW, but again, it's still this 4.3 inch touchscreen that has its own limitations. Still, it offers something more than what we've seen on the multi-track market previously. So fast forward now to October, November, of 2022, uh, 2022 and Zoom has recently released the R12 multi-track recorder. So this is very much the successor to the R8 because it's an eight track recorder. The setup is very similar. The feel should be pretty similar. It only has two inputs and you could route wherever those two inputs will go to which channels or which tracks. Um, has onboard effects. It's got a synthesizer track drum loops that are built in. So it's taking really a lot of the features that are found in the R20 and then combining them with the portability and the form factor of the R8 and making this chimeric unit, if you will, the R12. So I thought I just received this today in the mail uh, or from FedEx, and I thought I would unbox it here and kind of check it out for my first impressions of the R12. So let's take a look. All right, so we have the Zoom R12 in front of us here, and this is a very compact unit. It comes with a USB cable, looks like it's USB type A to USB type C, along with a power adapter in the box. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the power adapter is just five volts, one amp, so you could pretty much use any kind of power adapter that you have to get this thing to turn on. Um, you get instruction manuals and some warranty cards in the box. That's, that's it. Okay, so let's take a look, shall we? So we have eight tracks with our faders. Now the faders are have smaller travel distance or shorter travel distance compared to the R20. Um, initially, I'd say they feel okay, but they are a little bit looser than the R20 was brand new out of the box. What's different from the R12 compared to the R20 is it does have this dedicated effect fader to control your effect levels. And then it also has a 
master fader. We've got our transport controls over here for fast forward and rewind, stop, play, record, along with turning the metronome on and off. But we also have some more knobs here that we don't really find on the R20. So we do have our gain knobs for inputs one and two. We have an high Z input, but we do have this extra click control that allows us to balance where we're sending our click or uh, metronome track. Uh, do you want it to just be output to the phones or do you want to run it to the headphones but also to the monitor out? And then you can balance that with the click track to the master here. And I guess this also would control balance controls between what you would hear directly if you put headphones in here versus what potentially gets outputted if you had this hooked up to a computer and running it as an interface for your DAW. Um, you also have volume for your headphones and then output for the monitor as well. On the side here, nothing on the side. On the back, we do have a battery compartment for AA batteries, I believe. Yes, so it'll take four AA batteries to power this thing. That's optional. And then we have our inputs. So we have inputs one and two. These are combo jacks, XLRs, but they will also take quarter inch inputs. We have outputs, which are for our monitor out. These are quarter inch as well out. We've got a lock slot. Our headphone out, interestingly enough, is only a one or a, a 3.5 millimeter jack. So this is not a quarter inch jack. It's for kind of headphones that you'd wind up plugging into a phone or like an old MP3 player. We do have our power just button and then our input, which is USB-C. So our, this is gonna be USB-C for sending data back and forth, but it will also be for power. And as you can see, it says five volts there. So this is how we would power the unit. We don't have a dedicated power area. On the side here, we have a micro SD card slot. So in the uh, R20, we were using a full size SD card for this. We are only using a micro SD card. And I do have an SD card with me. So I could pop that into the unit. And the door to that stays attached. So you won't lose the door to the SD card cover. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Again, the build quality on it feels solid. Um, it does weigh a little bit more than I thought in terms of what you can feel behind here. There is some weight in the back. I think if you put batteries in here, you're obviously gonna add to the weight of it, but there is more weight on the left side of the unit. Still, it feels solid even though it's plasticky. Uh, the buttons feel identical to the R20, which is they're, they're plastic, but they're hard plastic. They're nice and clicky, uh, very responsive. You definitely know when you press the button. Um, for size comparison, I could put this up next to the R8 here, and you can see that this is quite a bit more compact and small in every dimension. Um, what the R8 does have, though, are some built-in condenser mics. There are no mics on the R12. And then I could put this up against the R20. So you can kind of get a comparison there. Let's see, how does that look? And you can see it is quite a bit smaller than the R20. Um, so this one is definitely meant to be portable and I agree. I mean, this, this fits in a bag if you bought a case for it or something. I think this would travel nicely, especially with the ability to just pop in some double A's and you, I think you get five or six hours of um, runtime on this if, you're, if you put in the four double A batteries. Compared to the R20, this feels a lot more like a desk unit. I mean, it's easy enough for me to move it from one area to the house to the next, but I don't really want to carry this thing around. Additionally, this thing is running off of a 12 volt dedicated power supply. There's no battery power here, so it's not portable. This thing is portable and it's designed to be that. It's designed to, I think, move around with you so you can record in multiple places. This feels a little bit more like a desktop unit.
All right, so I have the R12 plugged in. One thing to note is that I'm using the supplied wall power adapter as well as the USB cable. USB cable is only a meter long or just over three feet. So if you're far away from an outlet, you're going to want a longer USB cable. But I've got the thing plugged in. Power button's back here. Um, let's zoom into the screen a little bit. And then maybe I'll turn down the lights so we could see the screen as we turn it on. All right, hit the power button. You do have to hold the power button to turn it on. And you get the zoom splash screen. It says it's version 1.0. I know it's a little bit blurry to see there. But the first thing we need to do is set the date and time and we could change the different formats. We could change it to month, days and years. That's what I'm familiar with in the US. Move that over a little bit. So whatever, we'll just hit done for right now. And we are on the project screen. So this is pretty similar to what we have with the R20, where we can open up a new project or create a new project. Um, we have our cog wheel up here for the different settings. So we could set date, time, battery. Um, well, this actually tells you what kind of battery you have. So you have alkaline versus nickel metal hydride versus lithium ion, uh, depending on what your settings are. So it looks like you should set the battery. Um, maybe it knows what the drain is like. LCD bright uh, brightness. I could maybe turn this down a little bit and get some better contrast for the camera. Maybe that looks a little better. Um, LCD backlight. Uh, so let's see here. We've got on 30 seconds off. So this is just really for battery power, I think. It'll turn the, or just keep the LCD backlight off. It'll put it on or it'll give it a pause, 30 seconds, one minute, three minutes, five minutes, I'm guessing if you're on battery power in order to save battery power. Um, you can auto power this thing. Do you want that on or off? Um, you could set that. Audio interface, this is what you'll use. You'll have to select this if you do want to use it for an, as an audio interface for your computer. Guitar Lab allows you to hook this up to a computer if it's running the most current version of the Guitar Lab software from Zoom, and you can change what kind of effects are loaded into the system. The SD card and the firmware version, it's 1.0 for everything here. Factory reset, firmware update, it's kind of interesting. Um, place the bin file into the root card, into the root of the SD card. So that's interesting that the R12 has that um, as a dedicated feature that's not um, present on the R20. Okay, so that is our system settings there. Um, and again, we've got our different templates at the top that we could select. So this allows you to select templates based on style of music. Uh, I don't find these to be incredibly useful, to be honest with you. Just kind of sets a tempo and allows you to load in some drum loops right off the bat. Uh, I'd rather just load the drum loops on my own, uh, but it does give you the templates uh, there if you want to take advantage of it. Honestly, I pretty much never use this. The one thing that's new to the R12 compared to what's on the R20, at least compared to R20's version 3.0 of the firmware, is sequence play. Um, I'm not exactly sure how this works, but I think we could create a set list of projects, essentially songs, and have the R12 play that set list of songs in order. Don't know how it works yet, but it's kind of nice that that feature is there. Um, we can change how we sort our projects. Once you fill up the screen, you have a whole bunch of projects. You could sort it alphabetically or by uh, time. And then you also have details that you can open up changing the project name, changing the tempo, the time signature, the bit depth for the song. Do you want 16-bit or 24-bit? Uh, I'd recommend pretty much always leaving it on 24-bit. Uh, and then you could just hit create if you want. So we could create from there or we can hit create over here. So let's hit create and we have our new project. This is what the project screen looks like compared to the 
R20, you, you kind of see the same thing as what I'm noticing. You have four tracks that are visible right off the bat. The menu screen up at the top, all of these features for the most part are visible on the R20. You just have a couple things that are new and that is the plus minus zoom button here. Probably have to record, oh no, you could zoom in and zoom out with the plus and minus buttons. So I think the other thing that's unique is this microphone button here on the side, which should control our track routing. So here we can now determine where we want our input. Do we want input one to go into what track or input two to go into which track? Additionally on the side here, we've got our 48 volt uh, phantom power that we could turn on for inputs one and or two. So that is the general layout here for what you can expect to see on the track view. If we touch this little fader icon, we'll go to the fader view. And this again, looks similar to what we see on the R20. If I move the faders with the physical faders on the board, it moves the soft faders on the touchscreen. So that's kind of nice. This is the fader for the effect send. You can see that labeled as send at the bottom. And then there's also the master fader. And you can see how that is controlled. So the fader control really isn't bad. I mean, it's, I feel like it's a little bit looser compared to my R20, subtly looser, but still good. Uh, I, I could still finely tune this and it's responsive. I don't, you know, compare what I'm seeing on the screen here, um, matching up with how I'm moving the fader with my hand, it's, it's responsive. Uh, this is what you would expect a good set of faders to do. Um, there's, there, I don't see any problems with this. So one thing that I wanted to test out is if a USB battery bank could power the R12 all by itself. So I'm just using the cable that came with the R12. It's USB-A on this side, USB-C into power the R12, and let's try to turn it on. Just hold it down and it seems like it's working. Yeah, so this is pretty cool that you can just use a battery backup, a battery bank to supply the power to the R12. You can, again, use AA batteries, but if you don't have to, you could just use a rechargeable source like this. This is gonna give you endless hours of playtime. And this is one of the features that, frankly, I'm most excited about in being able to use the R12 with a battery backup bank like this because it truly makes it a portable device. This is gonna pair very nicely with a lot of other types of, say, portable synths that are running off battery power, or if you just have a small electric guitar with you, you could always plug this thing in and run this off, play around with, you know, noodling around on your guitar, trying to come up with songs. You could use the onboard effects. Great portable uh, device for that when you could pair it up with a USB battery bank. Next, we should try to record something on here. In inputs one and two, I'm using quarter inch jacks. These things are running into a 3.5 millimeter stereo cable that's plugged into a Teenage Engineering OPZ synthesizer unit. So I'll run uh, just a couple quick bars out of this into the R12, and then I'm running the headphone out of the R12 and recording that's so this way you can listen to what I'm recording. With the R12, the first thing that we have to do is set up our track routing, and that's because we only have two inputs for eight different tracks. So we have to determine which input is going to go to which track. Up at the top left here, I have it selected as an audio file. It's kind of difficult to make out um, with the lighting conditions, but it looks like a waveform. Next to that is the drum icon, so we could set up drum loops that way if we wanted to. And then there's the piano icon to set up a, a synth track if we wanted to. But let's go to just an audio track to lay down um, a stereo auto track or an audio track that we'll just put onto tracks one and two. First thing that we have to do is touch that microphone icon. And now you can see for the input routing, we have a whole bunch of ones at the top and then a bunch of twos underneath it. At the very bottom of the screen, you can see the color-coded tracks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, along with send and the master. So here's your track numbers, they're all color-coded. We need to determine which input 
you want to put onto which one of these tracks. So we can go ahead, let's put for input one, let's make that track one. That's going to record onto track one now. And then for input two, let's actually record that onto track three. So we're going to skip recording onto track two. Now that we have our input routing all set, all I have to do is hit the record button on the R12 and then the play button on the OPZ and we should be good to go for the most part. So let's give that a shot. Hit the record button. Now we've laid down our audio files and you can see that depicted on the R12 screen. So we've got something on track one and something on track three. The timeline marker is over here at the end of the song and we can lay a marker down there if we want to by hitting this little flag icon. Hit add and that now drops in a marker there. We could just call it intro. That's fine. You can change it if you want to. So, I mean, if we wanted to, we could just put this in as end. So we have a marker to work with. Hit enter, done. And now we've got a marker at the end of our song. If we hit the stop button on the transport controls, the timeline marker goes back to the beginning. If we hold down stop and touch the fast forward button, we go to the next marker, which is the end of the song. So it's always good, in my opinion, to add a marker to the end of your song. This way you can navigate through your tracks very quickly. So let's, again, go back to the beginning. We can hit the play button. It should just play back. Okay, so we're good there. It seems like it worked. It definitely recorded. However, we've got some spacing here at the beginning that would be kind of nice to trim. So how can we do that? Well, we can approach this with a couple, we could do a couple different things. The first thing is, is we have track three down here and maybe I wanna move that up to track two. I should be able to just select track three now on the side by touching the number and then dragging track three up to track two. You could see it changes its color because the tracks are locked into the colors that they have. Track three was kind of a yellowy color. And so now track two is this red color, track one being orange. Okay, so now we've got these two together and we could do a couple different things with it. One, we can move the regions around using the touch screen. So I'm using a stylus here because it's easier for me to manipulate the screen, especially since I can't look over the screen. I've got the camera positioned over the screen, but if you're looking over the screen, you could definitely touch these things with your finger and slide them around. It's not that pro it's not that big of a deal, but it allows me some more accuracy using one of these disc based styluses um, for demonstration purposes. But uh, the touch screen again is you know, intuitive and it's responsive enough. It isn't as responsive as an iPhone, but it does seem to work fairly well. Uh, I'm used to using it with the R20 and it's a very similar feel on the R12. It's just that the R12 screen is much, much smaller. So one thing that we could do is we can try to trim up these tracks. Now for demonstration purposes, I have two mono based tracks. I'm just going to go ahead and delete track two. If we want to get rid of an audio region, we just have to select it by touching it. And then you have this white tab on the side. Touch the tab and you're given an extra menu here at the top that allows you to copy, split, or delete the track. Um, one thing that I could do and show you to demonstrate is how to split a track. So if I just hit the fast forward button, it will move me through the timeline. 
in different gradations. So if I zoom in some more, it'll move me in finer gradations. But let's just go right here in the middle. And if I wanted to, I could touch this tab icon on the end of my audio region. And I can choose to split up my audio region. So if we touch that, I now have two audio regions that I could move around. So this allows you to easily manipulate your audio regions after you just recorded them on the color touchscreen. This is where you have the big advantage using the R12 or the R20 compared to all other multi-track recorders that don't have a nice colorful touchscreen. It's possible to do this using markers and the different uh, controls that they have with hard buttons on the different multi-trackers that are out there, but none of them work this well. This works a lot closer to what it's like to use a computer with a monitor and a mouse in my opinion. But we can get rid of these sections. So let's touch this and we can now delete that audio region. Execute that and we can delete this audio region by touching that tab and then hitting delete execute. Okay. So let's say, wait, we made a mistake. We don't want to delete that. Here's an undo button that allows you to go back one step. If I touch that, now my audio region is back. Then it converts it into immediately a, a redo button that let's go back and let's actually delete that region. Okay, but we can't go back two steps. If you notice, you only go back one step. So you do have to be careful with what you're doing, but it's nice to know that you do have the backup fail safe of at least a undo redo button to experiment with. All right, we've got our single mono track here that we want to manipulate. Let's move the timeline marker. We can also then use this plus and minus button to zoom in. And that's pretty nice. To... Okay, so let's trim up this area here because it has some of this dead space. One way to do that is to just make sure our region is selected. And now we can use the scissor icon. When we touch that, you can see our waveform. And with the waveform, you could just hit play. And we'll actually play your track. I can use the fast forward and rewind buttons to move in gradations here. And let's put it right there. And now we can choose to trim up this audio region. All we have to do is just turn it on, select it, and then drag this white line here up to where the timeline marker is. And now we could just back out and our audio track has been trimmed up. We got rid of that dead space. Now it's as easy as just dragging this thing over to the beginning and we won't have all of that dead space when we hit play, it'll just be uh, an empty quick second. So you can see that works nicely. And again, this is a big advantage over using some of the other multi-trackers that are out there that don't have the intuitive touchscreen controls. Overall, I think the R12 is a worthy device of your consideration if you are in the market for a multi-track recorder and you put an extra emphasis on portability. It's really nice that you can run this thing off of AA batteries or off of a rechargeable USB battery bank like I have here. That's fantastic. That's one of the main features that appeals to me as a user because I'm using pocket-based synths with, with batteries. So being able to just bring a bunch of battery-operated devices and something that's small like this onto a desk or bring it with me is a an attractive feature. Beyond that, I, I do think that the functions here are all solid. I like that everything is kind of right here on the front of the device. Everything fits and feels about right. There's nothing that's too far out of reach. I like that the knobs for controlling your headphone and monitor out volumes are right here on the top. I don't have to go hunt for those things around the sides. That's great. Being able to control the balance on the click control, that's another thing that's really nice. And having the fader for the send effects is a big plus in my book. In terms of the screen, it's totally usable. I was concerned that the small screen wouldn't be great for editing, and that's what it's supposed to be as an attractive feature with the R20 and the R12 is you got this touch screen that's color and you can intuitively edit your audio tracks. I thought that the small screen was going to be a limitation, but it's really not. I was able to navigate this small screen 
fairly well. Um, I was using the stylus. I do recommend you get a cheap stylus for it. It does aid with that and it does assist with that. But this is a $299 device, so you have to have realistic expectations for what that brings. You could invest that $299 into a nice audio interface if you already have a pretty good laptop or a computer, and if you've already purchased any kind of DAW software, you have a better chance of getting more pristine audio quality out of your recordings through that kind of setup as opposed to a completely standalone box. You are making sacrifices if you buy a multi-track recorder and you just want something that's gonna let you do everything all in one small standalone unit. Um, with that, I think the, one of the bigger limitations with this is that it maxes out at 24-bit and 44.1 kilohertz sample rate. 24-bit, that doesn't really bother me. That's pretty much an industry standard for the volume uh, dynamic range. I think that's totally fine. The 44.1 kilohertz is a little bit on the low end, totally fine for CD quality sound back in the day, with which was 16-bit, 44.1 kilohertz. So here you have 24-bit with the 44.1 kilohertz. The... The quality that you can get on this, I think, is good to very good, but you just can't get nice, really pristine digital audio recordings because you, you can't go up to 48 kilohertz. You can't go up to 96 kilohertz, which would really improve the sound quality if you could hit those higher end sample rates. So that's just something to consider when you're looking at a purchase like this. And a lot of other multi-trackers sometimes even max out at 16-bit, 44.1 kilohertz. I suspect that Zoom isn't giving us 48 and 96 kilohertz because a lot of their digital effects that they have been working on over the past 20, 20 years, um, I think are all centered around working with 44.1 kilohertz system. So that's my speculation. I don't know if it's true or not, but that might be why this thing maxes out at 44.1 kilohertz. So again, just something to kind of consider. Another thing to consider is maybe the processor that they put in this thing is a little bit slower than what they put into the R20. When I was trimming up some audio samples, I noticed that the display would drop out a little bit. So you'd only see certain parts of it, but if I had my waveform and I was trying to trim that up, I would notice that the screen was dropping that out. I don't know if that's something that's temporary, um, could be fixed with a firmware update, or it was only in my initial sort of testing here, or if it's something that's gonna be systemic as I use it um, over the next month or two. If I see that a lot more often, I'll be sure to mention it. But right now, that's what I'm kind of seeing, that the screen will drop out a little bit as you're making edits. I could still pull off the editing features um, as I want to, because I could use the timeline and stuff as a guide, but it would, again, be ideal if I could see my waveform when I'm doing that kind of editing. But overall, I mean, I think this is still a worthy device for people who are looking for a multi-track recorder. I think it caters more towards people who are in a rock band, maybe. They're using guitar, bass, drums, vocals, that kind of setup, because a lot of the f effects in here are geared towards helping those people out. Those effects are catered to, to those types of musicians. If you're a synth person, you could absolutely use it. You got eight tracks that you could work with, especially if you're just kind of using one or two hardware-based synths at a time, using the inputs here. Um, I think you're fine, but you're not going to have any kind of MIDI sync. There's no MIDI clock. That's going to be your big limitation if you're more of a synth person trying to record using a device like this. Not perfect, something to be aware of, but again, a lot cheaper than other synth-based recording devices like a 1010 Blue Box or definitely a Teenage Engineering TX6. So, you know, again, you get what you kind of pay for. This thing will work for you, but you do have to make those compromises without the MIDI sync, MIDI clock um, to work with. But overall, I mean, I think that this is a nice box, something that you can absolutely consider if you're looking for just a standalone device that you want to record with and you don't want the hustle and bustle and fuss of always having a laptop around with an audio interfa interface, some different USB cables, you got a mouse that you're working with and then you just want to record something. This just allows you to turn it on. It's ready to go within about 15 seconds and you can just record. And that's the beauty of having a device like this. It's really portable, sits on a, a desk, a small desk with maybe a small synth or a guitar for yourself and you are good to go again within seconds as opposed to having a big clunky sort of setup with a, a laptop or a desktop. So that's all I wanted to cover for this initial first look video. I plan on using the R12 more in the future and as I 
learned how to use it and learned the different features, I hopefully will be able to post more content on that to help everybody else who's interested in purchasing the device or who has it now and just kind of wants some tutorials. If you want to see anything specifically or you have questions about the R12, go ahead and add those to the comments section below in this video and I'll try to get to them in a timely fashion and if it makes sense, I'll try to post content centered around that. So again, that's what I wanted to cover today. Thank you for watching. Hope you found the video informative and I'll see you again next time. All right, goodbye.